Cindy. I didn't see you coming. Sneaking in. Good everyone. Small in numbers, but important in numbers, right? Wasn't it so great to see the church so full Sunday? That was so exciting. Everybody was on this side, so it was kind of like this. But uh, it was great having everybody here Sunday. All right, uh, we are going to be uh, in lesson eight. Uh, we're going to do the second part of this. I think I'm going to be able, it should be broke down in three parts, so one more after this. Um, and this one is we have the strength to persevere, uh, and it's the second part. So uh, we'll start out tonight. Let's uh, open up in a, in a word of prayer. John, can you open us up? Amen. All right. Ephesians 6, uh, 10 through 24 is where we're going to be tonight, like we was, like we was last week. <laughs> Um, we spoke last week about Paul speaking about the armor of God. That's what we were talking about last week. Very familiar passage, the armor of God passage. Uh, and Paul's picking up on these. Um, he's alluding to some things using the armor of God or giving it as an example. Uh, and this passage here points us to the very nature of the Messiah and his mighty work. So a lot of times, we, and we're going to talk about it tonight, we're going to actually break down the armor um, and, and the references to Roman armor um, do fit. There's nothing wrong with, with that analogy. But like we talked about last week, probably Paul had more in mind, not Roman armor, but uh, Old Testament um, scripture uh, and Old Testament allusions about battle and armies and things like that when he wrote this passage. And I'm sure seeing Roman soldiers, that, that was just even more for him when he was writing this and the Holy Spirit was leading him. So, but the, at the end of the day, this really points to the Messiah and his, his mighty works. It's through our union with Christ, the triumphant Messiah, that we withstand the devil's schemes and attacks. So the idea of the armor of God uh, is uh, alluding to Jesus and his victory over sin and death and the devil. So uh, we were speaking to the fact last week that he uses this particular example because we are in a spiritual battle. And we talked about that at length last week, that we are in a spiritual battle. If you haven't figured that one out, uh, you better wake up because we are in a spiritual battle right now. All, and it's going on all around us. Uh, in Ephesians 6, verse 10 through 17, Paul exhorts the Ephesians and us to stand firm by God's strength in God's armor in the midst of that spiritual warfare. So that's why uh, he uses that ideal of the armor, because uh, talking about that spiritual battle that we're in, and obviously, you need to be equipped to be in a battle, so that's why he spoke to this. And we spoke last week about being aware of the battle that's going on, and at this battle, we need the Lord's strength, and we need to be aware that we have an enemy, and that enemy is Satan. Um, Satan is not some um, made-up figure or some uh, storybook character or some uh, fable or whatever um, uh, the world would have you try to make up. He is a real being, and he is out there. He, and the Bible says that he uh, um, is the God of this world. He has control of things. He has power. Um, 
and uh, obviously he doesn't have power over God, but uh, he does have great power. Um, often when we talk about, we, we were talking about this last week, um, when we're reading the scriptures, Jesus, before he begins his ministry, at the beginning of his ministry, when he's in the desert and he's tempted, and if you remember the story, uh, the devil comes to him and tempts him with some things. Uh, but these were all things, I mean, the devil wasn't just pulling the wool, trying to pull the wool over Jesus' eye. Of all people, Jesus would have known uh, that he couldn't, he couldn't cash what he was um, offering. Uh, but that's the point, he could have, right? When he offered to give him great power and influence in the world, the devil could have done that. Uh, great gave him that great power and that great influence, great riches. He could have done all those things that he uh, was trying to tempt Jesus to take in return for his allegiance. And uh, that's because he has that power and authority in this world. Um, and obviously Jesus understood the bigger picture, the broader picture, and the importance of what he was there for and refused the devil. But um, so anyway, we talked about that. Uh, so tonight, uh, I wanted to talk about the subject of being equipped with God's armor. Uh, as we talk about this battle and we talk about the war that we're in, uh, we need to be equipped uh, with uh, God's armor. You know, uh, whether you're in law enforcement or whether you're in the military or whatever, uh, when you go out to um, uh, do your thing, uh, you need to be equipped with the best equipment you can have uh, because, you know, you, you may have to fight a battle. So uh, we talk about that in Ephesians 6, verse 13 through 17. I think I'm going to read these verses here. Uh, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be, uh, by, excuse me, you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So uh, we talk about the idea of being equipped, and, and he talks about these things that we need to be equipped for in this battle. So after telling us to put on the armor, uh, which we talked about, Paul now describes the honor, uh, armor, and he goes into uh, some detail about this armor. Uh, the first thing to recognize is that the armor is of God, right? And we, we kind of maybe read over that, not intentionally, but we kind of read over that ideal. But in Ephesians uh, 6.13, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, meaning it's God's armor. It's not your armor. It's not this guy's armor. It's God's armor that we need to put on, not anything else. The same honor, the, excuse me, the same armor that the Messiah wears in battle is also our battle gear. So these same things that the Lord Jesus Christ used and uses are the same things that we can put on and we can use, right? Obviously, we're not uh, elevating ourselves to the level of Jesus, but the things that Jesus did to fight the devil and the spiritual battle that, that he fought, uh, those are the same things that we can do. Right? We were talking about one last week, we were talking about the Word of God, and we're going to talk about that tonight, but um, <clears throat> that's a powerful weapon, right? It's an offensive weapon. The Lord Jesus Christ, over and over, when you see in Scripture, um, he, uses, uh, uh, he uses the Word of God against the devil, right? And, and particularly when we see that temptation in the desert, uh, that was Jesus' response each time, was to quote Scripture to him. Yeah, that was his offensive weapon. Uh, there's no reason to yield one inch to Satan if we put on the full armor of God. So if we put on this armor that Paul describes here, there's no reason for us at all to give one inch to the devil in his dominion, right? Because uh, Jesus didn't, and we don't need to either if we put this armor on. So as we talk about this there, starting in verse 14, uh, he says in the first part of that verse, he says, Stand therefore having your loins girt about, with truth. So we talk about the, the belt of truth. That's what he's talking about there. As we buckle on this piece of the Messiah's armor, we live in his truth and speak his truth, displaying the characteristics of our victorious king. Uh, Jesus didn't have to pull the wool over anybody's eyes. Jesus didn't have to lie about anything. Jesus didn't have to fudge the story. Uh, he just told the truth, and there's power in the truth, right? Uh, do not give the devil a foothold by not being a person of truth. 
uh, in your language, in your behavior, and in your attitude. We should always be truthful people, right? Um, not only as we speak to people, but in the way we act, right? If we tell people, uh, and that's kind of the bad thing sometimes we are as Christians, you know, we always telling people what they need to do, but we're often not doing it ourselves, right? And we need to live a life of truth, right? If we're a fake, then we're not living a life of truth. There was power in what Jesus said because not only was he telling the truth, but he was living the truth. And he was showing us the truth, right? And that was part of his nature. Preach the truth of the gospel to yourself and live in that truth throughout the day, right? So uh, the ideal of the gospel and the ideal of the truths of God's word, right? Those are things that we should be living out in our lives each and every day. And there's power in that, right? That's the belt of truth that we put on. That's one of the things that we need to do as a Christian in this spiritual battle. Uh, you know, you'll find out a lot that, uh, and I'm sure you guys have, uh, you're old enough to know that, that uh, uh, sometimes people uh, are lying, sometimes people are not trustworthy, uh, but Jesus is always trustworthy, right? Uh, and we should be too. So that I know that belt of truth. He also says in there, in verse 14, he says, stand there for having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. So that was the next thing he mentions here is armor. Uh, for a Roman soldier, the breastplate covered the chest to protect it against assaults and arrows. So uh, it was some type of metal fashion. I know, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure in Roman time, they may have in Roman time, but I know in medieval times, uh, they would wear armor. Uh, under that armor, they would also have, um, I forget what they call it, but it'd be like a shirt of chain link. I mean, that's what it was, little uh, pieces of metal uh, that they that could breathe, but it helped protect them against things coming at them. So uh, that breastplate was important because if somebody tried to stab them or somebody tried to throw an arrow their way, the, the breastplate would, would protect them to some degree. So Paul's language is drawn from Isaiah 59, uh, 17, when he speaks here, uh, where it talks about Yahweh puts on the righteousness uh, as a breastplate. In, in Isaiah 59, verse 17, the word of God says, for he put on righteousness as a breastplate. Uh, so uh, he puts on righteousness like a breastplate, right? Uh, his righteousness uh, protects us and it protects him, right? Um, once again, we're to, uh, we are to put on the virtues of the Messiah, we were just talking a minute ago about truth and putting on truth and living out that truth. That's power in that, right? There's also power in righteousness. Put on righteous qualities associated with your new life in Christ. There's power in that, right? Uh, the devil is always going to try to take us down a bad path. He's always going to try to get us involved in things we shouldn't be involved in. But there's power and authority in the living out a righteous life, right? Um Put on those righteous qualities associated with your new life. The righteous qualities reflect the life of Jesus. So when we live a righteous life, it reflects Jesus. That's what we should do, right? People should look at us and say, I, I don't, you know, I don't maybe understand that person. Uh, when they see us, it should be a reflection of Jesus, right? People don't understand him often. Um, you know, living a righteous life, a life that reflects Jesus, is contrary to this world. It really is, because this world is just the things that go on and the things that people accept as right and wrong, um, the things that people just do, and they don't see no problem in it. That's not good, right? It's, it's, it's a thing of the world. It's a thing of the devil, uh, and it's a spiritual battle, and we need to rise above that and live righteously because there's power in that, right? It protects us. It protects us from the things the devil could do to us. You know, uh, just kind of an example of that, if, you, if you're living a righteous life uh, and your brother, Billy Graham was a good example of this, right? Um, he had a personal uh, desire to live righteously and he did a lot of things that to the world they think maybe it was funny or odd, but to him it gave him great authority and gave him a great witness. One of the things Billy Graham, uh, all through his ministry, never did was he was never alone with a woman. Um, and I can tell you that's, that's extremely hard. Uh, I, I, don't, I still don't understand how he was able to do it, but he was able to do it. He was never alone with a woman unless his wife was present or somebody else was present. 
uh, so that there never was an opportunity for somebody to accuse him of something that he did. Um, and, you know, he very easily could say that didn't happen. And here's another person that's a witness to that. Right. Uh, plus, I would say that probably for him, uh, like anybody, he probably felt that was another way to another uh, thing of protection for him that he didn't fall into some trap or do something he shouldn't do because he never was, had the opportunity to do that, right? Um, you know, you, hopefully you learn, and I know young people don't sometimes learn this very quickly, but and some older people don't ever figure it out, but when we put ourselves in certain positions, uh, we really open the door to things happening that we may not intended to have happen, but they happen because we open the door to that, right? Um, that's why we should always be in the right place at the right time, uh, doing the right things, right? And living righteously because if not, we may find ourselves doing things that, you know, we look back on and say, man, I, I can't believe I did that, right? Uh, but he always had that, Billy Graham always had that uh, because nobody could ever say, and you, and you still to this day will not find anybody that would accuse Billy Graham of having an affair or accuse Billy Graham of, doing this or that, some type of sexual harassment, uh, those kind of things that you very often see in other ministers, uh, famous ministers, whether they're true or not. Um, I, I know growing up I had some uh, preachers that I really thought a lot of and uh, kind of lost touch with them uh, when I got out of church for a while. And, and as I came back into church, I um, kind of uh, looked them up to see where they're at and what they're doing. And then I find that uh, they're being accused of things which I would never have dreamed that they did. Uh, and, and, there was, and even in some of the cases, there was arguments amongst their own congregation where they really happened, right? But that's why uh, living righteously and, and having a righteous lifestyle can make a big difference for, in those kind of situations because just, for example, in Billy Graham's case, he, he always had a witness. Um, so nobody could ever really accuse him of anything because... He was never alone with anybody to, to allow that to happen. But, um, but the point being is righteous qualities reflect the life of Jesus. So put on the breastplate of righteousness so that you do not give an inch to Satan in the areas of impurity, lust, greed, or injustice. Uh, well, which goes back to what I said a minute ago, which is if you're not careful and you really don't make an effort to live righteously, you'll find yourself dabbling in and, and getting into areas that will take you down a dark trail. Um, again, we're in a spiritual war, right? And especially as a believer in Jesus Christ, especially as one who's trying to live for him, um, or if you're in a, a position of leadership, even worse, uh, there are demons and those in that spiritual realm that are trying to uh, do something to get you to fall. They're trying to do something not only to get you to uh, do something you shouldn't do, but they're also uh, going to do that so that they can show everybody else what you did so that they can take a few other people with you. How many times have you seen, uh, for example, a pastor who has, who has failed uh, righteously, and not only has it been a blemish on him, but it's been a blemish on the cause of Christ and it was detrimental to his church. It's maybe church split. I don't know how many times I've seen that happen. Churches split. People uh, quit coming to church because, you know, look at the pre what the preacher did. Um, so it's important that we not give the devil an inch in our lives, right? That's why it's important to put on the bus plate of righteousness. We realize who we are in Christ, and we live that new identity in righteous living, right? We have a new identity in Christ, and it requires us... It's a call for us to live righteously, not like the world lives, right? It's, it's amazing to me how much the world accepts things, you know, and, and thinks things are okay, uh, especially in this day and age. And to live a righteous life is really against the grain these days. So we have the belt of truth. We have the breastplate of righteousness. The third thing here is the gospel shoes in verse 15. He says, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So Paul says there, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Paul is basically saying believers should always be ready to herald the good news of Christ. Um, you know, if a, if a Roman soldier or any other soldier was putting on his armor and putting on his, his, his stuff for battle, a very important part of that would be shoes, right? 
be ready to move, be ready to, on, to go on the attack, be ready to defend, whatever I need to do, but I need to have shoes on. You don't see too many armies that are barefoot, right? Um, you know, if you remember your history, we just came out 4th of July, that was one of the problems that the American uh, army had in the, during the revolution, is, is uh, materials, uh, equipment, um, shoes, you know, at Valley Forge, if you remember the story of Valley Forge. A lot of uh, uh, soldiers died. A lot of soldiers had frostbite injuries related to the fact they didn't have a good pair of shoes, right? So shoes are important for the battle. And in this case, he's talking about the ideal of heralding the good news of Christ, right? What's one of the greatest uh, uh, things that we can do as a believer in Jesus Christ is to share Jesus with somebody. That's the last thing that the, that spiritual realm wants us to do, that spiritual battle that's going on, that dark force wants us to do is to share with somebody else how they can be freed from the, uh, the, that uh, realm and how they can be freed from the bondage to that realm. Isaiah uh, 52, verse 7 says this, very familiar verse, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publishes peace, that bringeth good tidings of the good, that publishes salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Uh, so even in the Old Testament, talking about the idea of bringing, that, bringing good news of God, right? And in the New Testament, we have the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's no greater news. There's no more powerful news than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God bless those that are shod with the shoes of taking the gospel to people and willing to do that, right? Uh, what's one of the greatest offensive things we can do to that dark spiritual realm? Shine light into it with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The devil would like nothing better for us to sit at home watching the blue tube, right? Doing nothing. Uh, and not sharing Jesus with anybody, because if, if, he can, if they can get us to do that, then that's another person that remains in the bondage of that spiritual darkness and will never see the glorious light of Jesus Christ because nobody's willing to tell them about that light. Uh, there is power in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we need to pro proclaim it, right? We need to go to every nook and cranny proclaiming the gospel of peace, and that's what it is. You know, the world's always looking for peace. They're always looking for uh, uh, help, and, and there's help in the gospel. There's peace in the gospel. Uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ will solve all the world's problems. Uh, they just don't see it. They don't want to see it. And uh, sometimes they don't know because they don't have the soldier out there in the battle uh, taking the message out like we should. In the midst of this passage on warfare, there is a message of peace. Through Christ, sinners can be reconciled with God and they can have peace. Uh, so he talks about that in, in that verse. Um, your feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. What is the gospel? Well, it's the gospel of peace. Where else can you find peace but in Jesus Christ? Where else can you find peace in your life but yet through Jesus? Uh, and that's the message we deliver. The world needs peace right now. The world needs uh, uh, stability right now. And there's peace and stability in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's our job to go tell them that, right? Romans 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus settles the matter, right? Jesus fixes uh, the turmoil between us and God. And we know this. We are all believers in this room. Uh, but maybe somebody's listening, they don't understand that, right? That as people who are lost, you're separated from God, you're in turmoil, you're in the bondage of darkness, uh, there's no peace, there's no hope, there's nothing there for you outside of Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ died on a cross for our sins, uh, he paved the way for us to have a relationship with God, and there's peace through him. We can have that peace with God through Jesus Christ. I don't have to worry about God's wrath, and we talked about this Sunday, the day of judgment, because I have peace with God through Jesus Christ. I am a believer in Jesus Christ. I've accepted him as my personal Savior. His shed blood covers my sins, and that gives me peace. And that's a powerful message to be able to deliver to a world that's in turmoil and a world that's in darkness and a world that's in bondage. And we as soldiers of the cross, as Paul's talking about here, uh, our feet should be shod with the gospel of peace, willing to go out, willing to tell people about Jesus. Uh, and I think that one of the problems we've had with the church 
uh, besides uh, some hypocrisy, is the unwillingness for us to share the gospel with people. I think that's probably the biggest problem the church has, even over the hypocrisy issue. Because in reality, although the world looks at us sometimes and they're maybe a little overcritical with us, right? They look at us and say, oh, I don't want to be like that. They, they can't even live what they're talking about. Uh, they fail to understand because they're not looking at it and spiritualized that we're uh, still sinners. We're not lost sinners, but we're sinners. We still fail sometimes. We still make mistakes sometimes. Uh, and they, for some reason, think that somehow we think that we're perfect or we're going to be perfect, and we're not, right? But we should be a witness, right? There should be an effort there. There should be something different in our life that people look at us and say there's something different about that person, right? Um, you know, we can't just sin like the devil and, and say, oh, well, sorry, you know, I just I'm a sinner. Um, but... I think beyond that ideal of hypocrisy, because I think a lot of people can look at us and say, yeah, I understand that. We all make mistakes. We all do things we shouldn't do sometimes. But I think more importantly, the thing that we've been bad about and has cost us a lot, cost this nation a lot, is the unwillingness to share the gospel and the unwillingness to take the gospel of peace to the world, right? Because I can tell you right now, um, if you're in, in connect, can, connect it with the world at all, you'll see that the world is in great turmoil right now. There's a lot of people out there suffering right now. There's a lot of people out there that are looking for peace in their life, and they don't realize there's peace in Jesus Christ because we're not telling them. Um, and that's one of the most powerful things that we can do is take the gospel to people. Uh, he goes on in verse 16 there, and he says, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. So that's the next thing he talks about is the shield of faith. Now the word Paul uses for shield is not the small one, the size of a frisbee that leaves the body exposed, right? So when he uses this word here, shield, sometimes you might think about the little round shield that don't really cover a whole lot, right? Um, and uh, it really leaves you kind of exposed. That's not what he's referring to here. He's referring to a big one, the size of a door uh, that will cover the whole body. The Roman soldiers, if you ever um, watch, maybe watch a movie or watch a history thing or read something or see something, the Roman soldiers would often carry shields that were as tall as they were uh, because they could, uh, they could put those shields in place and it would protect them from things coming at them low and high, right? And uh, you'll see often that one of the things they did in, in formation is they would gather together, which is just a good word if you think about it for a minute, they would gather together as soldiers and they'd put those shields together and they'd have an impervious wall in front of the enemy uh, at the enemy's darts and attacks. Um, and if you've ever seen that in the movies, that, that what they would do or maybe read it in a book, uh, they would come on a line and, and they could at one moment come up all together with their shields and have a giant wall down the front of their lines to protect their soldiers from what was coming at them. So. Uh, that's the reference that Paul's talking about here, right? Uh, biblical writers often refer to God as a shield, right? We see that all through Scripture, that idea that God is our shield. Uh, in Psalms 18, verse 30, the Word of God says, As for God, His way is perfect. The Word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in Him. That word buckler is shield. Right? He's a shield to us that trust in Him. He's our protection. I don't need anything else. I've got God on my side, right? When I'm, when I'm right, anyway, amen? When I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, as a believer in Jesus Christ, I've got God on my team, amen? Uh, and he's at the head, right? You ever play games, you know, and, and, was, and always, always pick the big people for the games, right? It's always the little people that got left behind and at the end because everybody always wanted the big person, especially dodgeball. You know, when I was a kid, I hated dodgeball uh, because it just was a way for... Uh, people to torment you, right? I mean, if you remember dodge dodgeball, but uh, the kids would always pick the big kids, right, for their team because they wanted them out front. Um, God's out front for us, amen. Protecting us. Proverbs thirty verse five: Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. So God's a shield to us if we'll just put our trust in Him and allow Him to protect us, right? You know, don't we often worry about a lot of things we don't need to worry about? You know, we're, we're all kind of bad about it, and some of us are worse than others. 
Um, and that's, I'm not, that's not a dig. It's just some people struggle with that, right? They struggle with anxieties. They struggle with fear. They struggle with all those things. But think about it from this perspective. God's on our side. He's our shield. He's our buckler. Uh, if God's on my side and he's standing in front of me, protecting me, what can really happen to me? Uh, because God has to step out of the way, right? God has to allow something to happen to me, right? Because he is my shield. And we forget that sometimes. Now, we know that for various reasons, uh, we live in a world of sin. There's sickness. There's things like that in this world. Sometimes God is trying to show us something. Sometimes God is trying to to uh, develop us and sometimes things happen to us that maybe don't seem like they're that fair or maybe uh, they seem like he's not protecting us but he is protecting us he's a shield to us nothing is going to happen to you that God's not going to allow happen to you now think about that in in respects to the spiritual battle we're in you have a whole realm of darkness out there doing their best to try to destroy you and tear you down, right, and everything else in this world, um, trying to drag as much to hell as they can with them. Uh, and here you are, not out there by yourself, facing that great enemy. You've got God standing in front of you as a shield. As a believer in Jesus Christ, as a child of God, God is your shield, right? Uh, and he's there to protect you. We have a shield to protect us from the darts of the enemy when we put on Jesus Christ, believing the promises of God, all right? So what we've got to do here is, because this is where we, we lose sight of this sometimes, things come into our lives, or things happen, we think, man, that's not fair, or where's God, or, you know, is God sleeping? Uh, you know, I don't understand why this happened. But what we've got to understand is that we put on Jesus Christ believing, that the, believing the promises of God. There's a whole litany of promises in the Word of God for believers. And that's ours. He wasn't talking about the other guy. He was talking about us, right? And when God says he's protecting us and he's a shield to us, he's protecting us. He's a shield to us, not just the guy next to me, right? And all the promises of God can be put on as a shield uh, to life, right? When we life gets tough, life's uh, hard, you know, go to the Word of God. Look at the promises of God that God has given us as believers, as children of God, uh, as disciples of Christ, right? Um, and those are things that we can put on to help defend ourselves against those fiery darts. Isn't the devil always trying to, it's like a, in a battle, trying to shoot darts your way, trying to hit you with a dart, trying to discourage you, trying to tear you down, trying to make you give up always trying always picking away but God is our shield we just got to pick up the promises of God and just call on those promises because there's power in that right uh, it's not some uh, success gospel because we know from the truth of the word of God that things will happen in our lives that we don't like that aren't really great things for us in our mind but God never allows anything to happen to us uh, so there's nothing coming our way that God you know God's not down the street not paying attention right and something happens right um, you ever have your kids out and maybe get a little distracted and you're looking the other direction and something happens to them right they fall or, or, or whatever because you're not paying attention God's not doing that right he's there he's protecting us he's watching over us and we can uh, we can stand in those promises. And we talk about that idea as we believe what he says about us, what he says is ours. So the promises of God are ours to pick up and take and, and use. We don't really have to worry so much. You know, why do we got to worry so much about stuff? God's on our side. You yeah? know? Uh, the next thing he talks about here is the helmet of salvation in verse uh, 17. He says, and take the helmet of salvation. Uh, that's the next thing he says. So put on that helmet of salvation. Roman helmets, uh, when we talk about Roman helmets, were made of tough iron or bronze with cheek guards and with an inside lining of sponge that made the weight bearable. So these are really heavy. Can you imagine having a giant piece of 
bronze on, t- on your head walking around. Talk about having a, a neck ache. Uh, but they would put uh, stuff in those to try to make them more bearable and the weight of them more bearable. Um, but these helmets were so powerful, or so strong, I should say, that you could literally hit them with an ax and the ax won't, wouldn't go through the helmet. Right? That's why that was so important to wear these helmets uh, because it protected them, right? So you could swing an ax at somebody's head and you might knock them senseless, but you weren't going to uh, bury the, the ax in their head. Uh, God's people are, put, uh, are to put on the hope that they have in Christ. We forget sometimes there's great power in that. You know, we look at this world and we look at the darkness of this world and we look at the things that are occurring even in our own life sometimes and they just stink sometimes. And let's be honest, right? And we lose sight of the hope that we have in Christ. You know, there's nothing in this world that can harm me without God's permission, right? And there is nothing that's going to separate me from God according to Scripture, right? And I have hope in Christ. And that's something I can put on each day of the week, no matter what's coming my way or no matter what's happening to us. Um, if you're trusting in Christ, then you don't need to listen to the devil's lies. You know, isn't the devil, this is one of the things that uh, a lot of Christians face, is they, they start to doubt their salvation. Um, and usually that's because they don't have a very strong relationship with the Lord Jesus. They're not really in Scripture. They're not taking the promises of God. They're not spending time with God. So because of that, they're kind of out there on their own to some degree, and the devil can kind of whisper things in their ears and give them doubts, and they have nothing to, to stand against that, right, because they're not strong enough to do it. That's why another reason why it's important to be in church, especially as a, a new believer. But those of us who have been around the block a few times and, and are living and trying to Uh, walk with Christ we understand that we have confidence in our salvation why because we know we have that relationship with him and it really doesn't work real well for the devil to try to to put that seed of doubt in our mind because we know we're in relationship with him so we're not going to fall for that one but um, we talk about putting on hope uh, so that you um, can be protected and don't listen to the devil's lies uh, say to the, to the devil in his dominion, I've been saved from sin's penalty. I'm being saved from sin's power. And one day I will be saved from sin's presence. That's uh, the, the hope we have in Christ. That's a, prom- that's a promise we have in Christ. There's strength in that when we put the helmet of salvation on. We can stand in the battle and say, you know what? Uh, I've been saved from sin. I've been saved from the, the consequences of sin. I've been saved from hell. And not only have I been saved from that, I've been saved uh, from uh, sin's presence one day. In other words, one of these days, I'm not going to have to worry about sin at all. One of these days, it's not going to be an issue for me anymore. One of these days, I'm never going to have to worry about being tempted. I don't have to worry about having a bad day. None of those things. Why? Because I have my hope in Jesus Christ. And that's like putting on a helmet of salvation. They can hit me all day long on on the top of the head, but they ain't going to crack that helmet. Uh, There's hope in Jesus Christ. In Isaiah 59, verse 17, For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and and a helmet of salvation upon his head, and he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. Isaiah talks about that ideal too here, right? Right? Um, there's power in that. First Thessalonians 5, verse 8. Be let, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. There's power. There's a helmet there. There's strength there. There's protection there. Uh, the devil can't uh, uh, convince us uh, that we're lost. The devil can't uh, tell us that, you know, what's the point, Right. Because we know there's hope in Jesus Christ. And we've been saved from sin's penalty. We've been saved from sin's power. We forget that sometimes, right? It seems like sin has uh, an influence in our life sometimes. It seems like we can't control that. But according to Scripture, we can. We have the power over sin through Jesus Christ. And it doesn't say that we're not, we're going to be perfect because we're not. But we don't have to live like the devil either. 
There's power in a relationship with Jesus Christ, the helmet of salvation. Uh, the next thing he talks about here is the sword of the Spirit in verse 17. Again, uh, taking the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So he's kind enough, the Spirit of God's kind enough through Paul to tell us exactly what the sword of the Spirit is. It is the Word of God. Uh, so the final piece of equipment, when we talk about uh, this equipment, this is an offensive weapon, right? We've been talking about a lot of defensive things, you know, how to protect myself uh, from the devil and his, his realm. But this is an offensive weapon. We kind of hit on this earlier. The believer must take up with a sword and engage the enemy. Uh, do not go into battle without a weapon. That's the problem with a lot of people who are Christians. They try to go into the battle, into the spiritual realm, without a weapon. And that weapon is the Word of God. It's not opinion. It's not church doctrine. It's not church uh, practices or rules. It is the truth of the Word of God. That's our offensive weapon. You're not going to win out any other way, right? Because there's truth in Scripture. There's power in Scripture. And that's our offensive weapon. And we are talking about that a minute ago. What did Jesus use every time the devil came at him? He used the Word of God against him. Because it's an offensive weapon that we can use against that realm. And why would you go into battle without an offensive weapon? I mean, think about it. You know, you think of it in the perspective of the Roman soldier. If the Roman soldier goes out on the battlefield and he's got all this great equipment that protects him, it really ain't going to do him a whole lot of good if somebody can walk up to him and continue to poke, prod, hit him. Uh, eventually something's going to give, right? Uh, because he has nothing offensive to fight back with. He has nothing offensive to, to do damage with. That's where we have the Word of God. Uh, because uh, this is a sword of the Spirit, right? It is spiritually powerful in combat. This is not a book of fables. This is not a book of men's opinions. This is the very words of God. That's what Scripture says it is. And it was derived by the power of the Spirit of God moving and working through men and giving them what to put down and what to, to write. There's power in this book, right? When we read or preach this book or teach this book, it isn't uh, my great wisdom. It isn't your great wisdom. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that moves and works in, through this book. I mean, you look at somebody who I, I've sat in, in pews and listened to men who had great, great, great wisdom about Scripture, and they were as dry as a, a forest fire, right? But I've sat in meetings where somebody maybe didn't give me a lot of Bible knowledge, but boy, they took the Word of God and the power of God took that Word and, and hit its mark big time. Because there's power in the Word of God with the Spirit of God. Paul identifies it here when he talks about the sword of the Spirit. He talks about it being the Word of God. Um, when you talk, when you break this down, though, however, Paul normally uses the word logos, but here he uses the word uh, uses the word term rima, which usually refers to the spoken word. And if that's the case here, then he's referring to speaking the gospel in the midst of the war. So he's referring to the ideal of sharing the truth of Scripture, particularly the gospel, in the middle of this battle. It's not that there's obviously power in speaking this book at any point in any places. But when we talk about the context of what Paul's kind of hitting on in here, uh, what you get the sense of, and when you break this down, is you get the sense of what Paul is really saying here is take the word of God, the truth of the gospel in the word of God, and there's offensive nature to that. Right? There's power against the, the devil and his dominion with the power of God's word and the gospel message. Um, it always amazes me, and I've talked about this before, but I've been out on the mission field. I've been to places uh, where I've preached the word of God to large crowds, crowds that were very um, uh, unruly, loud. Uh, when you would come to them, you would think, what am I going to do here? How am I going to get uh, my three or four points off. How am I going to do all the things that I normally do uh, because these people are really not paying attention? But the Spirit of God uh, will empower you, and I've seen this happen in my own life where the Spirit of God got a hold of me 
and took the Word of God, and the notes went out. I didn't use notes, but I used the truth of Scripture, the power of the gospel message, and preached my heart out with the power of the Spirit and seeing people quiet down, seeing crowds settle down, see people come to Christ, see things happen because there's power, offensive power in the gospel, spoken gospel word. That's why it's important for us to tell people, not just show them, but tell them um, about Jesus. Again, one hears echoes from Isaiah here about Jesus, about the Messiah. In Isaiah 11, verse 4, for he says, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor, reprove with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. So there's power in the words of God, right? All through scripture you'll see that. There's power in the words of God, all right? So if we, by especially in the power of God's spirit, take the spirit, the sword of the spirit, and speak it, and preach it, and teach it, and share the gospel, uh, there's power there, right? Now, I, I can, you know, you're talking about sharing the gospel and the truth of scripture. You know, you can go out and you can give all kinds of little flowery speeches and say all little nice things and use all the different illustrations you want to use. But let me tell you something, there's power in scripture. That's where the power is at. When you tell people that there's no other way given among men whereby men must be saved, there's power in that. When you tell people that God commended his love toward us and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, that's a message of power. All right, and I can say all the nice flowery things I want, but for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. There's power in that, right? I can tell people that they can do this, they can do that, but the Word of God says that if I shall confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in my heart God raised him from the dead, I shall be saved. There's power in that message. Uh, and the Spirit of God takes that message and he does what he needs to do with it. In uh, Isaiah 49, verse 2, And he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword, in the shadow of his hand hath he hid me, and made me polished shaft. In his quiver hath he hid me. Revelation 19, verse 15. And I will say, by the way, in Revelation, many times in Revelation, it speaks of the ideal of the word of God uh, and the power of that. But in this particular verse, out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and treadeth the winepress of the fierceness, of the wrath of, the, of, of Almighty God. There's power in the Word of God. There's power in the spirit of the Word of God. Amen? And uh, especially when we talk about the idea of the gospel message. There's nothing we can do that will impact the world more than to tell them the truth of God's Word and how they can be saved. There's nothing greater we can do for the battle. Right? We can stand at the courthouse and we can yell all day long about uh, this legislation and that legislation and how wrong this is and how wrong that is, but there's nothing like standing and telling people how they can be saved in the truth of the gospel. There's power in that. I'll push back that realm. We are given access to the weaponry of the Messiah for battle when we are united with him. So when we became a uh, child of God, we had this armor available. You know what's a shame about it is we a lot of us become children of God. The armor is like sitting in the corner and we're not using it. And we're getting pelted and we're getting knocked around and we're allowing the armor to sit in the corner that we could put on and we could have a defense. We are to speak the gospel in the realm of darkness that those who are held captive by the evil one may go free. And as we said before, there is an evil one. And it's Satan is his name. And, you know, he's not like God. I didn't mention this, and I know you guys know this, but he's not like God. He's not omnipresent. The devil is not omnipresent. He can't be in two places at once. He can't be influencing. That's why he's got a realm. That's why he's got all his dominion. That's why he's got all his demons running around doing his work for him because he's not God, and he can't be in two places at once, and he can't watch over one thing while another thing's going on. But he can rule this world. He can send his dominion out. He can send his demons out. He can affect things, right? 
but there's power in the armor that God has given us. If you were to go to a museum, and we talk about this idea of the sword here, uh, if you were to go to a museum and look around, you'd probably see lots of old swords. I, I like military history. I like all that kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, I don't, we watch television all the time. You see people swinging swords around. Uh, some of them swords, especially medieval swords, were extremely heavy. Um, I'm not sure that I could pick some of them up myself. Uh, even if I could pick them up, it would be really difficult to wield them. Uh, many of these swords were heavy and they were difficult to deploy. They were difficult to uh, go into battle with because they were so heavy. Uh, they are, uh, they are um, also useless in today's modern warfare. Um, I don't know about you, but if I was in a battle over in uh, Baghdad I, I, and they handed me a sword, I'd be a little discouraged. Amen. Um, that's not what I would need in today's modern warfare. You wouldn't see one issue to a modern soldier. However, uh, similar this is to their, it's very similar to their opinion about the Bible, um, that somehow it's useless. Sometimes this, uh, you'll hear people say, that, well, that's just an old book. People will say, well, that's just, it doesn't matter. That's old history or that's old fables or that's old this and this is the 21st century we don't need this book anymore we don't need anything about this book uh it, it was nice it's it's nice to have on the coffee table amen uh it's nice to have a few of them around so you can say you do do that right many people admire the bible we may put the bible on display in our home somewhere right uh, normally a huge Bible. I've been in houses before and, and look over on a, on a shelf somewhere or on a table somewhere is a Bible sitting there all dusty and while it's the same time you've got pornography on the TV and you've got all kinds of other ungodly things going on, right? So we, we got to put the Bible out there because it makes us look good, right? Um, we put it on display. Uh, usually it's one of these big ones, right? But some of these same people never use the book that can help them. You know, the Bible is the number one published book in the world. Still is. But it's the least used. And yet the Word of God tells us there's power in this book. There's power in these words. There's power in the gospel message. And it's like looking at it in perspective, we wouldn't take an old sword into a modern battle. People say, well, why would I read this old book when uh, there's all these newfangled things that might help me with this problem? Let me tell you, the word of God has got the answer to every single problem in your life. The answer is here in this book. And God will show you and he'll help you with it if you'll use it. Like an ancient sword, a lot of people deem it useless for their daily battles. We talk about this idea of battles and the offensiveness of the word of God and the offensiveness uh, of the gospel message. But yet we sometimes look at it as useless in today's battle. It's easy for us to go looking elsewhere for other kinds of weapons in our trials. Don't we do that? We go down and see the doctor because he can give us some pills we go down and see the doctor because he can let us lay on his sofa and tell us, uh, we can tell him all about our problems and it make us feel better. We can go over a self-help book at the store. It'll tell us how to do this and it'll tell us how to do that and how to get out of this problem. We can go over and ask our neighbor. We can go ask our friend. We can ask a family member what they think I should do. But when do we go to the word of God and let it tell us what to do? Because the truth is there. The power is there but we deem it useless. Have you found yourself doubting that the Bible actually has the power to help you overcome the tactics of the enemy? How many of us as Christians spend every day or a lot of days of our Christian life battling things out and we feel like we can't get the victory over it and we feel like we, there's no hope for us, we feel like we just can't get past that, but we never pick the word of God up and use it offensively against the devil. We never pick the word up and see what it says to help us. We never use the things that God has given us for the war, for the battle, the way he intended us to use it. And we're trying to do it ourselves. If so, this should not surprise you. In the Garden of Eden, one raised doubt and suspicion about God's word caused sin. Right? Right? God said very simply, he gave a very simple message 
He just told Adam and Eve, don't eat from that tree. Do not eat from that tree. That's all I ask. You can do anything else you want here. You can eat whatever else you want. Just don't eat from that tree because it'll be nothing but problems. And, and what happened? The tree didn't jump out and grab them. The devil came along like Satan does, and he caused them to doubt the word of God. But they should have did is said, no, you know what God's word said? It said, don't touch that tree. Nothing good will come from that, and I'm not going to touch it. No, what they did was, hmm, maybe he's right. Maybe that's not what God means. Isn't it interesting how we still have that happen today? People look at something and say, well, that's really not that bad. God really didn't say that. That's really not a sin. That's really, that's just old-fashioned thinking. See, that's the same thing that's been going on since the garden. The devil trying to get us to believe that God's word's not true. When all we have to do is just listen to God. Adam and Eve wouldn't have faced what they faced. We wouldn't have faced what we faced if they had just listened to God's word. As simple as that. But the devil raised doubt and suspicion about what God said. But don't be deceived. Do you know this evening you can trust God's word? You need God's word. You need this book. I need this book. And we can trust it more than anything. More than your spouse, more than your parents, more than anything else in this world, you can trust this book. Because I, I can tell you right now, and, and if you've been married any length of time, you know the truth of this, amen. Your spouse will let you down sometimes. I'll let my spouse down sometimes. My parents have let me down sometimes, right? Not they didn't necessarily mean to, but it just happens. Because the Bible says we all sinned and come short of the glory of God. This book will never let you down. And the truth of it. Read it. Meditate on it. Pray it. Sing it. I was, a old preacher used to talk about, you know, reverse and all thy ways acknowledge him. And he shall direct your path. And he had a little song. He, he would sing that. Uh, I'm not going to do it because I can't sing but he'd sing that verse. He just made up a little song, and he'd sing that verse. Speak it to your brothers and sisters. Proclaim it to the world. There's truth in it. You know, I'm not asking you to... I'm not asking you to believe me. I'm not asking you to join my church. I'm not asking you to be a Baptist. I'm just asking you to listen to what God has to say. And this is what God said. There's power in that. There's power in this book. It's a shame we don't use it the way we need to use it. It's no wonder that we don't have the victory that we should have in our life, in our spiritual walk, in our churches, in a lot of things, because we're not following this book. We're not in this book like we should be. You know, I don't know how many times I've told you this before, but I've talked to people, and you talk to them about something, and, and this is what you hear well, I think God love them. It doesn't matter what they think. What's this book say? That's what's the matter. What does God's word say about it, right? I don't know how many times I've heard, you know, you talk about two people living together. You know, well, I think that, you know, it's, it's really not that if they love each other and, you know, you hear all that stuff, right? What's the word of God say about it? Because that's what matters. I just use that as an example, but there's many other examples of what I'm talking about. That's what we have to fight the battle, amen? Next time we're together, we'll do the last part of this and end this uh, study, uh, and uh, we'll be moving on to something else. But uh, I hope you've enjoyed it, but, uh, and we'll finish out this the next time we're together. Let's have a word of prayer and be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, the chance to come together to study your word. Lord, uh, give us wisdom in it. Father, help us to live it. Help us to apply it. Help us to use it offensively and defensively. Lord, help us put on your armor like we need to put on it. Lord, and stand strong. 
Lord, and make the difference. Lord, may we storm the gates of hell itself, Father, with your strength and your power. And Father, Lord, uh, help snatch people from its power. Lord, help us be the people we need to be. We give you glory and honor. Take us safely out of here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone.